as I've stated last week, you guys are going to, at the end of the series, either love, love that song or hate it. Um, <laughs> uh, my hope and my prayer is that you all love it. Uh, Narles Barkley obviously wrote that song, and uh, just big fat credit to uh, Transformation Church for uh, the use of their video and obviously artwork for this amazing, amazing, I want to say church changing series. Uh, crazy faith. It's again, it's our hope. It's our prayer. Uh, it's our desire that Holy Spirit would not only inspire and challenge, but also make change in each of our lives. And guys, that's what this whole series is about, is kind of getting us out of that mindset of like that God isn't big, that God isn't capable. Because if there's one thing that I can look at from Scripture, and I'm not saying that God always carries out the things that we desire, but it's simply this, is that God is able. Amen? God is able. Amen? I mean, guys, this is huge. Guys, if we could actually learn to live with crazy faith, guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man, the change that would happen in our city. And I'm not just talking like our little church here. I'm talking like, man, if we as the city church of Medicine Hat actually rose up with this idea of our faith, let me tell you, is crazy because of what my God can do. Our city would be changed. Our city, guys, it, what if our city was saved? What if society, instead of being divided, was united around the cause of Christ? And I firmly believe, guys, and maybe this is just Dave being crazy, but I firmly believe that it's going to happen because of our crazy faith in our crazy, amazing, crazy, awesome, crazy, powerful God. So crazy faith, well, what is it? Well, last week we kind of looked at what is the definition of crazy faith. And so we can look crazy, uh, it's simply not mentally sound, right? It's uh, you know, marked by thought or action that would lack reason. And I joked last week. I said, if you can close your eyes and you can kind of like hear me define what crazy is, not mentally sound, it's marked by, you know, thought or action that just simply lacks reason, right? As I, I kind of joked, I said, go ahead and, and just picture the person that you're thinking of when I read that out. Like, who is that person that is crazy in your life, right? And some of you would be like, sitting beside them. A little bit elbow, like that, that's you, honey. Just so, you know, those little love taps, you know, that... Like, you know, usually at night, they kind of initiate stuff, right? Those kind of love taps. Like, that's you, honey. Like, you're a little bit crazy, right? But, but, then, but then, right, is, is, is I kind of joke because I said, go ahead and put your hand up if you know somebody who lacks reason in their thought or action. And if you didn't have your hand up, I kind of pointed at you. I said, well, guess what? You're probably it. You're the one that the others are thinking of that have their hands up. But then we looked at the latter half of that is faith is believing something. And again, I understand. I know faith is actually scripturally defined, right? In, uh, I think it's Hebrews, right? Is faith is, is uh, it's, it's, it's the confidence of things unseen. But in layman's terms, it's believing something that you cannot explicitly prove. Right? And I talked about, actually, well, the simple guys, the, here's the thing is, like, I have faith that Jesus died and rose again. And hear me out. You can judge me or not. But it's not because the Bible tells me so. I, in fact, I believe that the Bible is accurate and true because that Jesus died and, was, and, and rose again. Some of you are like, well, wait, what do you mean? You don't believe it because of the Bible? No, I just believe in the validity of the Bible because of the simple fact that my Jesus died for my sins and he rose again triumphant to bring me and us abundant life. And that's the basis of our Christianity. That's the basis of everything that we found ourselves on. And so inherently because of that, I believe that Scripture in its entirety is completely relevant and completely true. And so I can't prove to you guys, some of you are like, but you're the pastor. You should be able to prove that Jesus died and rose again. I can't explicitly prove it. And to be real with you, I don't think you can either. I mean, I'm sure we could say, well, it's because, because of what I experienced, Dave. And I get that. I totally understand. And in my life, in the same way, I, I, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that Jesus died and rose again because of what he's done in my life. But I can't prove it because my experience is different than your experience, isn't it? And your experience is very different from my experience, right? And we all, we all live different lives. But hear me out, guys. It's sort of tough. 
if we weren't there to prove it, isn't it? And so that's why we read in Ephesians, right? It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's like we appropriate our faith onto the simple fact that, God, your grace is sufficient for me. And so we use our faith to actually obtain and attain salvation. Isn't that amazing? And that's why, guys, that's why we have to look at this series and be thinking like, man, Holy Spirit, this, I, I, know, it's, I know it's March 13th of 2022. It's just like a day like any other day. But it's my hope, guys, it's my prayer, it's my desire that this series, that what we go into today actually will make crazy change in your life because of crazy faith. Because I know I talked, right? It's like, well, we might not, we might all know somebody that fits in that top category, right? Now we talked about elbowing your husband, but like we learned last week, it's actually good to be a little bit crazy when it comes to our faith, isn't it? So all you husbands and all you, you know, wives that got that elbow or whatever, you know, even if it was virtually, right? Let me just tell you, way to go. Way to go. Your spouse, the person that is like most, like knows you best, would simply say you're crazy. And I would say, awesome. Because hear me out. And, and, and let me just clarify. It's not just the top half. It's, it's all of it. Is where our faith is one that other people would look at, those even closest to us, that would look at us and simply say, man, your dreams and what you hope and what you believe for, they actually lack reason. To which we would say, yeah, I know, because that's how crazy good and crazy amazing my God is. And guys, hear me out, okay? I mean, this might blow your theology. I'm not trying to raise your faith level. That's not what this series is about, is to get us to, you know, like, go up three levels in Christianity in terms of our faith. Oh, good, I got enough experience points. I can actually move up to level 14. I'm a level 14. That's not what it's about. It's getting our faith to actually align with how big God is. That's why Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain. He was basically saying, guys, it's not the level of your faith. It's the level of trust in how big and how great and how awesome God is. So my hope, my prayer is that each and every one of us are momentously changed into more like the image of Christ, the image of God that we are actually called to live in. And now here's the thing, right, is last week I left you with this takeaway, and it was just simply this question, is am I willing to be a little crazy with my faith? And I mean, I didn't even leave you with like an actual action step. Like, hey guys, here's what to apply to our lives. Now go and do. I simply left you with just this question. What if you were to just go and ask this question? Am I okay to be a little bit crazy in my faith? To which I know each and every one of you, you guys remember everything that happened last Sunday. I know that you all the whole week long are pensive and thinking about what happened at church on Sunday. I'm just joking. Usually it's done by lunch, isn't it, on Sunday afternoon? And so some of you are seeing this question and being like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that question. Yeah, I mean, when, 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 when I hit McDonald's, I completely forgot about it because then I thought, oh, man, I want to I make double. But now that you're seeing it again, I want to ask you, are you willing to be a little bit crazy in your faith? And again, like last week, we learned, guys, you know, we had the chairs up here. It's not just simply about believing that Jesus is who he says he is. It's about trusting and actually putting a little bit of weight into what he says, isn't it? Right? So some of the examples I gave, right? You're believing for that spouse of your dreams. Well, maybe the weight that you need to put into it is to up your standards and stop dating scumbags. Or maybe you're believing for that better job and you're just like ho-hum in your mundane life, your ordinary life, and you're not actually getting your name out there, a.k.a. resumes and interviews and all that. You're just like, well, God will give me the better job as long as I just sit here and wait. That interview is going to all of a sudden, poof, happen right here at my present job. No, you got to put a little bit of weight into it and actually step out in faith and trust God for something bigger, something better, something greater. Some of you are like, oh, God, I believe that you are my source. God, I believe that you are with me. I believe that you want what's best for me. But we don't ever actually take the step and put some weight into being generous with others. You guys, it's a both and. And so when I ask you this question, are you willing to be a little bit crazy in your faith? 
I guess what I'm asking is, like, are you willing to actually not believe who Jesus is, but actually step out and trust and give him an opportunity to prove it? Because, that, guys, that's what it is. It's, it's not just this heart thing. It's actually this action, right? Last week, I just simply said, believe and do. Believe and step. And here's what's crazy. If I can talk about what's being crazy is what's crazy now could be faith later. What's crazy in this moment right now, you're like, I could, I can't, I mean, God, I know that you want, I know that you want what's best for me, but I cannot even imagine my spouse being in love with you. I couldn't even comprehend my spouse coming to their senses and letting go of that addiction that is ruining their life and actually fall wholeheartedly in love with you. God, that is crazy. But let me just tell you what's crazy now. Guys, it could be faith later, couldn't it? I mean, when Noah, we talked about this last week, when Noah built the ark, that was probably a little crazy, wasn't it? I mean, even his sons were probably, looking, Dad, this ark is massive. It's just for the five of us? Like, what's going on? But now we look at that whole story, and what's it a story of? It's a story of Noah's faith, isn't it? And so in your life, what's crazy now could be faith later. And, and let, me just, let me just tell you, If that's true, then the opposite of it is true as well, isn't it? If what's crazy now could be faith later, we could say what faith is now was probably crazy before, right? What we would look at in our lives and we would say, well, that's just amazing faith. Well, let me tell you, at some point it was probably crazy, right? I've, I've compiled a bit of a list of some things in my life, and Shai's life, and our church's life, and our family life, that if I were to look back, now I'd probably tell you, man, that, that is crazy. And so maybe you can relate to some of these things that I'm going to read. Maybe some of these things will inspire you, even in your faith. But I made this list actually about three and a half months ago when I was preparing for this series. And I met with the staff actually, we were over at the My City Care building that, oh, even is another crazy faith story. But this is what I read. I said, if you would have told me four years ago that Shy and I would have the staff and team that we now have, I would have said, crazy. If you would have told me that after two years of a pandemic, we as a church would be able to cast vision for a building renovation, I would have said, that's stupid, shut up. If you would have told me that we as a church would start a ministry in our city based off Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, you remember, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was clo- naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you helped me. If, we would have, if you would have told me that we as a church would start a ministry in our city based on Matthew 25, and guess what? And clothe and feed over a thousand people in its first year of existence. Think about that. In the, in, the midst, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a time when everybody was saying the church is going to get shut down, we clothed and fed over a thousand people. I mean, on that note, if you would have told me, hey, Dave, guess what? My city care would have its own 2,100 square foot building in the first year of its life. I would have said you're an idiot. If you would have told me that in the midst of a pandemic, we as a church would grow, look around. Those of you that have been attending here for years, look around. Every week, it's like, what, God, what are you doing? We keep on having to put out more chairs. We keep on having to rearrange the chairs to fit more people. We had to ask Sarah to make a slide that said, scooch into the middle, please. To which I would look at some of you in the middle and say, thanks. (laughs) But if you would have told me we would see that, in what we would hope and believe would be the end of this pandemic, I would have said, that's crazy. Because guys, hear me out on this. Statistically, churches did not grow in the midst of this pandemic. In fact, more churches shut down that were planted in 2021. 
Like, think about that. And I'm not talking our city. I'm talking like North America. If you would have told me that we as a church would be able to see the financial blessing that we're walking in in the midst of this pandemic, I would have said, bring it on. No, I would have said, that's crazy. I would have said, that's ridiculous. And I shared it last week. If you would have told me that for this building renovation, we as a church have been able to save in the past two years $70,000, I would have said, that's ridiculous. This one, I think of my friends Clark and Shelby. And Celesta and Stephanie and Lindy and Robin, Tamara, if you, would have, if you would have told me that Global Prayer House would go through a great reconciliation with the City Church of Medicine Hat and the new base directors would actually be great friends and part of our church family with us, I would have said, that's ridiculous. There's so much division. There's so much hurt. There's so much offense. There's no way that God would reconcile Global Prayer House with the City Church and Medicine Hat, but yet here we are. If you would have told me that the crazy goal that Shy and I had set in giving away X amount of dollars personally as a family would be surpassed in 2021, I would have said that's ridiculous. And if you would have told me that two of my kids so far would be baptized because of their public confession of their faith, I would have said that's ridiculous because do you know how many pastor's kids walk away? Do you know how many pastor's kids don't find value in church? But my two oldest kids love it here. My daughter says, next to Alpha, Dad, it's my favorite day of the week. It's my happy place. If you would have told me that, 13 years ago when we started having kids, I would have said, wait, you said three kids? We're going to have three? <laughs> I would have said, I would have said, that's crazy. But guys, what's, what's crazy now could be faith later. And what's faith now? At one point in our lives, it was probably crazy. You probably have your own testimony. You probably have your own story. You probably have your own experience of where you're like, man, if you would have told me that I would see this, let me tell you crazy. Some of you are in here right now even thinking, if you would have told me that we'd be planted in this church four years ago and finding hope and finding provision and finding peace because I found God, I would have told you, you're nuts. Some of you I talked to this morning, if you would have told yourselves that three months ago, that one year ago is when you would last take a drink, you probably look back at that and say, that's ridiculous. It's crazy that I'd be sober for one year. That's crazy that I'd be sober today for three months. But guys, what's crazy now could be faith later. So this morning, guys, kind of moving along, I want to take us through a bit, of a, a bit of a story in Scripture. And it's found in Mark chapter 10. And hold this slide, please. But this is, this is Jesus walking into Jericho with his disciples, with his entourage. And just like Jesus always did, he was performing miracles. He was teaching the goodness of God. He was teaching the hope that is found in him as the Son of God. He was teaching all this stuff. And healing all these people. And then it came to a point when they were like, okay, well, we've done enough here in Jericho. Let's make our way to the next place where we're going to go and minister. And it just so happened that on the outskirts of Jericho, sitting on the street, was a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus. Some of you are like, man, Dave, we've heard you speak on Bartimaeus before. Well, yeah, because it's scripture, so I'm going to preach on it again. I hope that's okay. But here's Bartimaeus, this blind beggar that is sitting outside on the outskirts of the city. And again, guys, he's blind. He can't see what's going on. He probably had someone come and uh, come up to him and say, guess what, Bartimaeus? This, this commotion or, you know, this, this, this thing that you're hearing, all these people walking, that's Jesus, the one that you've heard about. 
The one that you've probably even heard stories about him healing other people and mer- working miracles and teaching the goodness of God. And so what does Bartimaeus do upon hearing of this, this, this happening outside the city of Jericho? Well, he does what I honestly, I hope each and every one of us would do. He cries out to Jesus. This is what he says. Go ahead, next slide. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, of course, it's in his weakness. It's in this place of like absolute destitution where he's been begging probably, who knows, for most of his life. And I mean, back then, they thought that if you were blind, you were cursed. And so basically, that's why they were on the outside of town. They weren't even allowed inside town. They were given these cloaks. They were given these kind of like big coats that would signify them to be able to actually beg for money. And Bartimaeus, in his brokenness, decides to call out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And again, I hope and my prayer is that each and every one of us in our circumstance, in our brokenness, in whatever it is that we find ourselves in, that we would take the same stance. Jesus, have mercy on me. And I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you already do that. Like, Lord, I need you. In my everyday life, God, even, like, even though things are actually going good, Jesus, I need you. Do you, are you a person of crazy faith that would call out for Jesus? Because again, guys, he was blind. He was separated. He was an outcast. I mean, what gives him the right to call on the Savior of the universe? What gives him the right to actually call out to the person who's so busy with his entourage and with all the people? It's his crazy faith. That's what gave him the right to call out. Amidst my weakness, amidst my circumstance, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then you know what happened? It's what happens to a lot of us when we walk in crazy faith, isn't it? All the people that were crowding around Jesus and all the other ones there, probably even some of the disciples, looked at this blind beggar named Bartimaeus and they basically said, shut your mouth. In in fact, in Scripture, you can read this in Mark 10, it says they actually rebuked him for calling on the name of Jesus. And guys, isn't that sometimes what happens to us? Is our crazy faith when what we're believing God for is met with whether it's other people or our own voices saying, are you sure? I'm believing for a baby. Yeah, but, but if God was going to give you a baby, wouldn't he have he, he already done that by now? Oh, I'm believing for the spouse of my dreams, but, but wouldn't he have already kind of done that by now? Oh, God, I'm believing for this better job. Yeah, but, but you've been there for 43 years. Don't you think that you'd have a better job by now? But God, I'm believing for my spouse to fall in love with you. Yeah, but it's been, it's been 13 years and he just won't make any, ch- there's been literally zero change in his life. Don't you think that it would have happened already? Do you have the voice, whether it's of other people or perhaps even other believers, or perhaps it's your voice that is coming against what it is that you're believing for in your life? And it's filled with doubt. And it's filled with rebuke. Well, guess what? You know what we need to do? We need to live the life of a blind beggar. Because amidst this stuff, amidst this place in his life, right, is even when, even when, you know, we're walking in faith and it could be crazy to others. When we're walking in faith and it actually would be crazy to, you know, even like our own self-doubt where we'd be walking in faith and it would be crazy perhaps to even some other believers. In the same way Bartimaeus, you can go to the next slide. In the same way Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and was instantly rebuked. Guess what happens? Bartimaeus cried out even louder. He cried out even more desperate. No, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. To which, guys, his crazy faith, his, his, his effort to actually step forward, let Jesus, it, it got Jesus' ear. And Jesus said, hold up. And he stopped his entourage and he said, call him forward. And then instantly, get this, instantly the tone of the people changed all around him. And isn't that what happens when the voice of Jesus speaks into a situation? 
All of a sudden, the same people that were rebuking him were like, hey, dude, cheer up, man. Life is great. Life is grand. Come on, he's calling you. Come on, I'll go with you. I'll stand right beside you when we go up to Jesus. It's going to be great. The very same ones that were rebuking him were now like, oh, we're with you, man. You got this. And so Jesus calls this blind beggar. And in that moment, do you know what happens? It says in Scripture, it says in Mark chapter 10, it says he threw off his cloak and jumped up and ran. I could just picture him like running and glaring with his blind eyes looking at all the people who rebuked him like, I'm going, he threw off his cloak, guys. And let me just tell you, this, this, uh, the significance of him throwing off his cloak, I've already said it, that was given to him to validate him, to verify him as a blind beggar. It gave him a source of income. It gave him the opportunity to legally beg for alms. And yet, guys, and hear me out, and some of you know the story that he received a sight, but in that moment, he hadn't received his miracle yet. He hadn't received, I mean, he didn't know what he was going up to. He just knew that it was Jesus, and Jesus called him. So he, he threw that thing off as if to say, I don't need this anymore. My faith is so crazy, I don't care what this son of, God, this son of God says to me, but my faith is crazy enough that I'm leaving my comfort. I'm leaving my source. I'm leaving what I'm used to. I'm leaving what I'm comfortable in. I'm leaving it behind, and I'm stepping forward into the presence of Jesus. And guys, that's what crazy faith does. If you're believing for something, then get out of what's comfortable, and you step into what God is calling you into. I don't know your situation. I don't know your circumstance. But sometimes, guys, our comfort zone is just simply, I believe God can do it. I believe God can do it. But we don't throw off our, our, our ordinary life and actually step out in prayer and get on our knees and say, Lord, I need you right now. We've got to throw off the cloak. Because crazy faith, guys, crazy faith for later will always cause you to make changes in your now. So my question, are you ready to throw the cloak off in your comfort, in your, in your ordinary life, in whatever it is that you're living in? Some of you I know, you're saying, but my life is good. I'm comfortable right now. But what is the next thing that God is asking of you or from you or for you? Are you willing to be like Bartimaeus that would throw that cloak off and go running, glaring at the rebukers, glaring at the, the voices even in your own head? They would say, well, B, you can't, or God can't, or, you know, you're not, you're not good enough, and you're not, you know, you know, you're not well-spoken enough, you're not good-looking enough, you know, you're all those things. Are you willing to throw it off? Because crazy faith for later should cause you to make changes in your now. And see, then, the beautiful part, Bartimaeus goes, and he's before Jesus, and Jesus utters these words that will literally blow your theology because he looks at Bartimaeus and he simply says this, what is it that you want? Like, think about that. What is it that you want? And kind of come on up. What is it that you want? I mean, many of us, I mean, we grew up in church and we quote Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all my needs. And it's, guys, it's a bit of a myth in church, isn't it? That is all, God is only out there to supply what it is that you need. He doesn't care about your desires. He doesn't care about your wants. He doesn't care about the things that you're hoping and believing for. He's just out to meet your needs. You got food? Good. You're done. You got a shelter? Good. You're done. No, God... Jesus himself looks at this blind beggar and he says, what is it that you want? And let me just tell you, I looked up in 53 other versions of scripture this past week, looking, trying to find where Jesus said, what is it that you need? But out of the 53, 42 said want. You know what the other 11 said? What wilt thou want? Or sorry, what? Let me just read it. This will blow your mind. What wilt thou shall I do? 
In other words, what is it that you want? See, some of us are like, well, I, I, I'm so caught up and, and I'm, so, I'm so comfortable in God providing my needs. But God would simply say, what is it that you want to this blind beggar? See, in my life, I got to be real with you. About four years ago, I was meeting with a, with a church growth coach, whatever you want to call him, like just somebody to help us as a team. His name is Kevin. And we set some goals for our church, right? Like, oh my God, like, like Kevin, I want to see, I want to see our church like release leaders. I want to see our church grow. I want to see, you know, have, plant churches all over a minute, like all these crazy things. And then, and then this is what he says. Well, what do you want? What, what is it that you need to see what it is that you want? And I said, well, honestly, Kevin, the biggest thing I think I need right now, I need an associate pastor. Because Shy and I, we can't, we can't carry the load ourselves. And so this is what he says. He's like, awesome. Let's ask God for it. And so I remember I was on a Zoom call with him. This was before we had to Zoom. This is just because we wanted to. I remember I bow my head. And I'm waiting for him to pray. You know, like, God, would you send an associate pastor Dave's way? And it was silent. Finally, I looked up and he's like, are you going to pray? Oh, me. Oh, you want me? You want me to. In fact, Jesus, you know, looked at Bartimaeus and he says, what is it that you want? He was waiting for Bartimaeus to go ahead and declare what is it that he wanted. So I prayed and I said, well, Lord, if some of these things, some of these hopes and desires that you've put in my heart and Shai's heart for us as a church, then Lord, what I want, I want a crazy loyal and absolutely humble and teachable associate pastor. And in my mind's eye, I was like, I don't see it, God. I, I mean, who is it going to be? I have no idea. Well, let me just tell you, not even 48 hours later, my man, Randall, phones me out of the blue. We haven't talked for seven years. He says, Dave, can we chat? I got something on my heart. And he wasn't phoning to say, hey, guess what? I think I'm going to be your associate pastor. No, he was calling in his brokenness, actually. And you've heard him share about his depression and all that stuff and PTSD and all that stuff. He phoned me to basically say, Dave, God put you on my heart. Could you help me through the struggle in my life? I was like, well, that's, that's kind of humble. Well, I mean, he's asking, that's kind of that's teachable. And I mean, I had to actually give him an opportunity to prove the loyal part. But here we are, three years later. And you have to know that we as a church took a step to hire him quarter time to move into the associate pastor role. Can I get in a man? You guys, 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 what is it that you want? What is it that you want? I've already shared. One of the things that we want as a church is to completely renovate our building, not just because it'd be great and awesome to have a brand new, fresh building, but it's so that where those bars sit, we can build a big, fat wall. And so all the people that are sitting at the very, very back can sit in church in booths, and I don't care if you're listening to the message or not. It's so that you can come and you can be in this place for the sake of community and connection, because isn't that what it's all about? Because, guys, we don't get discipled in a row. That's not how we grow. We grow in a circle. We grow in connection and community with other people. And so our hope, my desire, is that one day in September of 2022, that I can be standing on this brand new stage here and preaching to a great group of people. And for the others, the great group of people that are on the outside that are building connection, that we can collectively fall more in love with Jesus and be made more into his likeness and his image. And so let me just tell you guys, crazy faith, guess what it is? It's specific faith. It's not just asking God, I just want to see your goodness. Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, I want to see. Well, of course he wanted to see. He was blind. But that was his desire. That was his want. And so in my life, in our church's life, 
I want to preach from here. I want this crazy faith kind of idea for us as a church that we would be able to grow. We would be able to see more and more people fall in love with Jesus. That we'd be able to see more and more people set free in the freedom that he gives. So I have a bit of a list in terms of being specific for my faith. I, I want to see... I want to see my brothers fall in love with Jesus. Some of you that would know my story, I want to see in my family. Mom, Dad, where are you? I want to see full family restoration. I want to see my nephew Emmett completely healthy and whole. Speaking of us as a church, I want to see us as a church pay for our complete building renovation without borrowing a dime. I want my city care, our permanent location to be open full time, helping the community to the max that we can. I want to see our church at over 110% involved in small groups. Think about that. I want more people in small groups midweek end of week, beginning of week, whatever. I want to see more people in small groups than actually attend on a Sunday morning. I want to see our church send out short-term mission teams. This one's huge. I want to see, get this, I want to see 365 salvations every year. And that's just based on scripture where it says their numbers were added to daily. I want to see my kids be devoted followers of Jesus and better leaders than Shyla or I. I want to see them in life-giving relationships with godly spouses. I want to see me and Shy's marriage, one that inspires others within our city and province. And personally, I want to see my family be able to give away more than we ever have before. I want to see the church known for taking back its responsibility as opposed to camping on its rights. I want to see leaders continually released into ministry. And you might be wondering, why am I standing up here on this stage as I read these things out? Well, as an act of faith, I want to preach from right here. You know what else I want? My brother's salvation. already said it. I want to see my nephew's healing. I want to, I want to see I want to see 365 salvations. I, I'm willing to get specific with my faith. And so I guess the question is, is are you? Are you in the place where you want to get specific with what it is that you're believing God for? Some of you, like I talked, I mean, you might be you might be three months sober, one year sober. Maybe your crazy faith goal is I want to never drink again. Maybe some of your crazy faith goals is like I want my husband to fall in love with Jesus. Maybe some of you are believing for that baby. I want a baby. Maybe some of you are believing for even more friends that follow the hopes and dreams that what it is that you're believing for. And guys, let me just tell you, this is a bit of a disclaimer. Because to be real with you, I kind of want a Porsche 911. 
But I know that that crazy faith goal isn't going to bring glory to God. Because what's interesting in Mark chapter 10, it's verbatim where Jesus says, what is it that you want me to do? It's actually the second time that he says it in Mark chapter 10. Do you know who he says it to the first time in Mark chapter 10? His two disciples, Peter and James. And he goes to them and he says, what is it that you want me to do? And Peter and James in all of their humility go and say, well, when you get to heaven, can one of us sit on your right and one of us sit on your left? You know what Jesus' response? He doesn't receive your sight. It doesn't receive your healing. It's like, can you drink this cup that God has given me? No, I'm not going to answer that request because you know what? I know your heart. It's all about you. And so guys, this isn't a vending machine that we just go, well, if I just write on there, oh God, I just, I just want a million dollars. It's not about that. It's about honestly matching our faith with what it is that God is already doing in our lives. It's about his glory. You know why I know that? It's because right after he said, what is it that you want? And Bartimaeus said, I want to see. Jesus looked at him and he says, go, your faith has healed you. And then the next verse is up on this screen. Go ahead. He got his sight. Then he followed Jesus. So this crazy faith that I'm walking in, that I'm trying to live for, is so that I can follow Jesus. It's all to him. It is all for him. So here's my question. Can you be a little bit specific in your faith? Because if so, I got a lot of Sharpies up here. So if that's you, I want to challenge you even right now. You can say, you know what? I have a crazy faith goal. I'm willing to put myself out there and to face this wall that we're most likely going to paint over anyways. But I want to plant my crazy faith goal. And here's the great thing, guys, is as we do this, you know what's great? Is it allows other people to see what it is that you're believing for. What it is that you're hoping for. Maybe, maybe somebody is going to see that and say, you know what? I'm believing for my brother's salvation. I'm going to pray right alongside you as you believe for your brothers. So who is it? You got a crazy faith goal? I got lots of Sharpies. Come on up. Holy Spirit, we thank you. God, that you move in our lives. God, I pray that as we get specific in our goals, God, that you would challenge each and every one of us to perhaps be a little bit more specific in our faith, God, because that is indeed crazy faith. And so, Lord, this morning, God, we as a church, we as individuals, we believe for more. We believe for your goodness. We believe for your grace. And Lord, even for a lot of us, I pray that we would not go from here without at least taking a peek at what some of those are. Because God, sometimes you call us to be the resource as people have just declared you as their source. So God, would we as a church join with others? Would we as a church join with each other in believing for what it is that you've put on our hearts. So in your name, we just say thank you for your good. In your name, amen.